Thanks uh, for inviting me. And I really want to talk about this embrace disruption theme as soon as I get my slides. Uh, you see? It's true. So I want to talk about this embrace disruption theme uh, because it's, it's what Mozilla does uh, is disrupt, but disrupt with a, a very particular purpose. And so in particular, what I want to do is talk about Mozilla as an example of an organization that embraces disruption. Uh, and I want to talk about the clicker working, how we use participation as a tool of disruption. So I'm going to go through that uh, and in particular talk about how we use participation to move markets in a particular direction. And that's something people often don't think of when they think of Mozilla, that what we do is we get people rallied behind something, doing something, participate, to push the web in a particular direction. And where we want to push it is towards openness uh, and towards an open web. Uh, so we get participation going to move markets towards an open web. The clicker is not awesome. Um, and I'm going to use two examples in that. I'm going to talk about the one you probably already know, uh, which is on the next slide, uh, and that's Firefox. And I'm going to talk about, can I have a next slide, please? Because the clicker is not being awesome to me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how we get people, in particular technical people, involved in disrupting uh, and moving towards an open web with Firefox. And that'll be my first example. Next slide, please. But I'm also going to talk about the role that you out there can play in participating and driving uh, us towards an open web. And there we go. I get a next slide this way automatically. So first of all, um, who has heard of Mozilla before? And who knows that Mozilla is um, a $100 million a year social enterprise? So not very many people, but that's what we are. And so we're very happy to be here at, at SOCAP because you know, we exist for a purpose. And the purpose we exist for is to guard the open nature of the internet. We don't exist to make Firefox. That's a way we pursue this mission. And so you know, what I want to talk about, next slide, please, is how Firefox fits into that mission. And you know, we use a tagline often, uh, innovation on the open web, that Firefox is something there to, to fuel innovation, get people doing new things on the web. And when we do that, next slide, please, um, what we do is we get developers involved in that job. We have, it's powered by engineers and web developers. Next slide, please. And oops, there's, go back, please. <laughs> um, and so the goal we have in getting people involved uh, in something like making Firefox in that participation is, in particular, this. And what this is is what you hopefully see or something similar if you went to view source and looked at, the, at any web page, which is declaring that the web page is made of HTML. And of course, we're not just interested in promoting HTML, but all standards-based technologies, JavaScript, CSS. And in some ways, Firefox is, is really just a lever to push those things, because we see those things as the raw material of creativity and innovation on the web. So next slide, please. And so. The point I was trying to make a, uh, when you saw the second ago is that's very boring. So not very many people want to get behind the cause of doc type HTML. Um, but if you go to the next slide, please, um, what I think people do realize is exciting, and what I think after a number of years we realized that what's exciting about that doc type HTML, what's exciting about the cause of promoting standards is the innovation that happens. And so, you know, how many people remember webmail? when you had to just hit reload, reload, reload all the time. And those were horrible days. We're now in days where you can go and use something like Gmail or Google Docs or lots of other things. And because of the standards that are, are there now um, or have kind of come back in a renaissance like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you actually have a lot of innovation. You have things that are like uh, regular desktop apps but that work on the web. Next slide, please. Um, but that is not the way it's always been. We got involved with a number of other people in trying to shift an ecosystem so that would be possible. And so next slide, please. If you go back to the, where we started when we started the organization in 2003, next slide, please. Um, the ecosystem was very different. Uh, if you count up those numbers in the red box, you can see that Microsoft had basically a monopoly on how people saw the web. And the result of that, next slide, please, was you know, not just that a monopoly is bad in its own right, but if you hit next slide, please, and blow that up, um, we were moving towards a web where you could only see the internet through Microsoft Internet Explorer. How many people remember getting those kind of pop-ups saying, can only view this with Internet Explorer? 
So the people who started Mozilla, and I wasn't there then, that's what they wanted to do in terms of shifting the ecosystem, in terms of getting back to standards, was something that meant anybody could view any web page on any piece of software, because that is necessary for the kind of innovation and creativity that the internet has brought to us. Next slide, please. The other thing that was happening is you were starting to see a different kind of website. And if you look at this nice World Series site from uh, ESPN in 2003, uh, it doesn't look really anything special, especially by today's standards. But if you go to the next slide, please, and look at the source code of that, you just hit view source, um, and then hit next slide, you'll see that the, all of the content of that page is a flash file. There's no HTML in it really at all other than just call, to call the flash file. And so what was happening is the core tool of innovation on the web, which was view source, that I can go to Gmail or I can go anywhere else and see how a page was constructed, which is what one of the main things that has fueled the speed of innovation on the web was disappearing and becoming opaque and closed. Next slide, please. So that was the environment that we were in in 2003. Um, and we said, we can actually change that with participation. Next slide, please. Um, and so, as I said earlier, uh, we got a bunch of developers involved in that. And what this is, uh, is just this ju uh, July, uh, it's 600 Mozilla developers at our biannual Mozilla Summit. And so those people make Firefox. Um, in fact, those people and about 19,000 more people, most of whom are volunteers, make Firefox. Um, but they're not the only ones in, who participated in shifting that ecosystem. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, these, these two guys, the guy there with the keyboard, uh, works for us now, it hasn't always, is a web developer. And the other people who were critical in shifting that uh, ecosystem were not the 20,000 people who built Firefox, but web developers all around the world who said, yes, doc type HTML, yes, we want to get back to the point where we're not just writing for Internet Explorer, we want to get to the back to the point where standards are driving innovation. These people were critical in driving back the web back towards openness and in the direction it needed to. Next slide, please. But of course, it, it wasn't only them. Uh, it was also a whole lot of other people. And does anybody know who those people are or what that is? So I don't see anybody. Oh, there's a hand up. Oh, that's Lee Futney. He's a shill. Um, so yes, that is, he was on the plane with me. Um, so uh, that is the New York Times ad that launched Firefox 1. And it was a $250,000 ad placement, or maybe about 200, dollars uh, all of which was paid through by small donations. And those are the names of the people uh, who donated for that ad. And it's a two-page Sunday New York Times ad. So from the beginning, the desire to shift the ecosystem and keep the web open was about participation by engineers, by web developers, and by people who used Firefox and cared about the web. And let's just see what those people did. Next slide, please. So this is now two and a half years old. We really need a better, newer graphic, but the stories are the same. Um, really, you know, there was actually a Mozilla project before the foundation was formed, and it puttered around long for a long time. But then when we simplified things with Firefox, and when uh, we got a lot more people involved, things started to change. Um, and as that started to change, the web started to change. That's around the same time you start to see Web 2.0 and Ajax and all of those things, all the things that you love now, which, of course, we can't take credit for, but we were a part of the disruptive force that helped drive the web back towards openness and innovation. Really, the web was stalled in that period. And so what's more interesting is this is a few years old. This, we were at 120 million users in 2007, early 2008. Uh, now we're at 400 million people, a quarter of the web, basically using Firefox. But more important, next slide, please, is we went from in 2003 to the next slide, please, to that 2008 picture where you actually now have choice which really is important if you think about the internet as the most important medium as our time, of our time, that you have choice. And that this thing which we think of as about individual creativity, there was for about five years basically no choice. But next slide, please. The more interesting thing is since then and now, you have a lot more choice. And in fact, everybody to the right, and increasingly the one on the left, 
are people who are driving that doc type HTML world. The, the degree to which people are viewing the world through standards friendly browsers is increased dramatically as a result of competition and innovation. Next slide, please. And so that's awesome for the goal that we had. Next slide, please. And you can go through these ones quickly. It's also for, uh, awesome for innovation. Uh, you can go to the next one. It's awesome for cr creativity. And finally, it's awesome for moving markets. And so that's the thing to underline. What we did was we got all of those people involved, not in going to Congress, not in rallying against the doors of Redmond, but in building something that moved the market back towards what the web is about. And that's what Mozilla likes to do. So next slide, please. Uh, and that, of course, is about uh, you know, using an ecosystem. It's not about us. It's about the web developers, about the people in the New York Times ad, and about you. So let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, and here are some of the awesome things uh, that exist in that ecosystem now that in the Internet Explorer world probably wouldn't have on their own. So let's go to the next slide and the next section. And sorry, it's going a little slower than I thought because I, I can't click. Um, so right now, and this is one of my jobs at Mozilla, we're thinking that if we want the web to be open for the next 50 or 100 years, that participation is absolutely essential in that mission, but it cannot just be the participation of engineers and technical people alone that will keep the web open. And so if you give me the next slide, please, what we've started, and it's the thing that that I spend most of my days on is something called Mozilla Drumbeat, which is innovation on the open web powered by everybody. Next slide, please. Which translated in simple language is, we want everyone to build cool shit that makes the web awesome and open. And by everyone, next slide, and we can go through these quickly, we certainly still mean web developers, uh, but we also mean educators, and just stop on that one for a second, well, stay with media makers, uh, and media makers, et cetera, stop there. Um, in the sense that web developers are, are pretty predictable as the kind of people we would get involved in participating, and we have in the past. But we think that how educators think about the web and shape the web in education, and how media makers think about the web and use the web in the media they make, and others in other aspects of society, will have as much impact on the shape of the web, on its openness in the long run, as engineers and web developers do. So what we've started with Drumbeat about nine months ago is to find ways to invite these kind of people into Mozilla to join us in that same cause and build things that keep the web open. So next slide, please. Um, and to move particular markets that relate to those people, their work, and their lives. Next slide, please. Uh, and build an open web. Next slide, please. It's hard when your clicker doesn't work. So, one goal that we have now that I want to talk about here, and it's an example of what we're doing with Drumbeat and with bringing new people uh, into what Mozilla does, uh, is this. Um, does anybody know what that is? So that's something really awesome. It's the video tag, uh, which is the ability to put video into an HTML page. And many people here probably don't know, 18 months ago you couldn't do that in any browser, uh, including ours. Uh, and over the last 18 months, we've moved to the point where now every single browser, including IE9 when it comes out soon, uh, make it possible for you to put video inside of a web page natively instead of using Flash. And if you go to the next slide, I'll admit that that is also very boring. But the things that it enables, the things that I believe it will enable will blow your mind. Next slide, please. Um, so if I told you what that video tag was about, and certainly our goal is for that video tag to win and influence the shape of the future of the web, uh, what I think is, involved, is coming from the video tag is the radical reinvention of what moving images are. So I want to tell you a little bit of what I see happening in that, just me personally as somebody who's interested in this, um, partly as a way to recruit you and get you excited about the potential of that boring goal uh, and actually doing the stuff that's going to be necessary to make it happen. Next slide, please. Um, and actually, just quickly as a setup for, for what I want to tell you, as a part of this overall drumbeat initiative, uh, we've started basically a lab, a lab inside of Mozilla called WebMade Movies. Uh, and it's a lab that is 
web developers and filmmakers and journalists all coming together under the same banner to move towards the idea of that video tag, but also innovating and shaping uh, where the future of the moving image goes. Next slide, please. And who we have running the lab is this guy, Brett Gaylor. Uh, he is the director of a film called RIP, a remix manifesto. Uh, but more importantly than Brett, if you go to the next slide, really the idea is the lab is a place for you. There is a place for journalists, for filmmakers to come in, work with technical people, and learn what the cutting edge of web technology can do in terms of uh, furthering your creativity and your ability to communicate. Next slide, please. So before I go into why I think that lab is interesting, um, we need a bit of history and talk about how disruption has happened in media and how film has changed over the years. So next slide. Um, so we can probably all relate that in the 1800s, photography was awesome. Um, you know, we hadn't seen such realistic pictures ever. Here's a lovely picture of a train from the 1800s. But something happened towards the end of that century, if you go to the next slide. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows what this is. It's moving. And guess what's going to happen? What's going to come out of the distance? Could it be? Yes, yeah, a train. And so this is the very first film that the Lumiere brothers made, um, where all of a sudden, pictures are moving. So that's a huge disruptive shift. And um, one thing, though, that you notice, all the motion happens in the frame. It's just like a piece of theater. It's just like me walking across the stage to the train. And so if you go to the next slide, that big disruption happens in 1895. But then something else happens uh, you know, 30 years later. And does anybody know what this is? Yes, this is Potemkin. And so what happens with Potemkin? Exactly, it's the invention of montage. And so the story now gets made between multiple pictures, and the motion is not just the motion of the camera set up on a tripod and fixed. So that's a huge, huge shift in our ability to use film for something useful and is the basis of the art of cinema and the art of telling stories and the art of journalism uh, to this day. So if you go to the, the next slide, to me that montage moment was a huge and powerful disruption that, that to me is notable than, more than any other moment in the history of cinema in terms of creating, changing the craft of telling story and enabling what many of us in this room have done. And so if you go to the next slide, what's interesting is not much else happens after that. And so when you go to what I think of as probably the most significant media event in, uh, in the history of my life, uh, Duran Duran releasing Hungry Like a Wolf in 1982, basically, you know, we're, we're still living with the same technique of montage, which is awesome, right? It's a great way to, to tell a story. But, you know, we got color and we got sound, a bunch of things. But really, this is the, the lexicon of film. Uh, we haven't had another montage moment, but I think we're about to. So next slide, you know, what does the future hold? Um, well, the future probably still holds more rock videos. Uh, they're different now. They're on YouTube. But even the rock videos on YouTube um, aren't much different. They're still in a box, and it's still a nice montage. Uh, except for this one that just came out about a month ago. If you go to the next slide. Um, has anybody seen this video? So a couple people. And so what it is, for the people who haven't, is this is a video by the Arcade Fire. And some of the things you'll, well, first thing you need to know, it's made with that stupid little video tag. And it's the first rock video ever that takes advantage of that video tag. And one of the things you're able to do because it's that video tag is easily pull information not just from the editing bay but from the internet into the film. And so that's actually my street. So I entered my zip code at the beginning of this. And what happens is the narrative is a set of timed events, but the montage is basically things that I've generated are driven on the internet uh, combined with what the, the filmmaker wanted to, to do. And of course, the filmmaker is making the, the very obvious uh, joke, formal joke, that they have broken out of the frame because we have all of these frames going on together. But I think what's more interesting than the breaking of the frame is the internet is inside of this film. So go to the next slide. I think that's what's happening in 2010. And I think we can't quite see it yet, but we're at that montage moment, or we are in the next few years. Things are about to get radically different 
Uh, and it's because of what the video tag lets us do in terms of bringing the rest of the internet into the film and the film into the rest of the internet. I'll give a couple more examples in a second. Uh, but next slide, please. Um, so, you know, I, I think what we saw with that archive fade fire video and what it is about to do, what I hope you're about to do, is awesome for the video tag, next slide. Awesome for innovation, next slide. Awesome for creativity. Uh, and awesome in terms of moving the market towards a very different kind of filmmaking that is the web and journalism and filmmaking fused. Oh, there's still another next slide that I already talked about, and then another next slide. So what's important to stop and say before I look at some other examples is essentially, just as was the case with web development, what we're talking about here is the transformation of a craft, the craft of telling stories. And I think that is about to happen. In fact, we've already seen it happen in many ways just by the disruptive power of the internet's accessibility and reach and cheapness. But I think this is going to th change things even more. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, you know, that's about the ecosystem evolving. And that's something we actively want to work with people like yourselves to, to make happen. Um, next slide. So the question, what's it going to evolve into? And Vince, who invited me to, to talk here, said, uh, tell people you know, where you think the market might go. And I don't know. Um, but I can tell you three things we're playing with um, that maybe hint at what to watch for. So if you give me the next slide, um, the first thing is I think you're going to see the connection of time and hypertext. And what do I mean by that? So here's a lovely video that Brett made. Uh, who runs the Webmade Movies Lab, about why the internet is so wonderful, and it's a nice little mini documentary. Um, and of course, you know, he made it in Final Cut, and the timeline is moving along. If I moused over that, I would see the timeline moving. So the medium is still montage. But if you go to the next slide, here's a screen capture of the same video uh, with a JavaScript library that Brett and the lab people have written called popcorn.js. And what popcorn.js does, and it's in its very, very basic um, early days, is it lets you attach any piece of code, any hyperlink, uh, any piece of metadata to any pixel or any frame in the video. And so what's happening is as, and this is of course in kind of fast motion, that same video is going and when people come on the screen who are from a certain spot, so there's Jonathan Zittrain, you see where they're from and where they were tagged. Their Wikipedia article comes up. Their Twitter feed comes up. Photos about them come up. And so all of a sudden, we can, with a very simple, small JavaScript library, make the film aware of the rest of the internet and pull that back in. And the layout here is very boring, and there, there's, there's too much going on. But you can get the idea now that the timeline is not the only dimension, that the rest of cyberspace is now another orthogonal dimension of how you can create this film. And this is something that was the actual JavaScript library thrown together in about five weeks by a bunch of students before we went to that Whistler Summit. Uh, and now has, uh, I don't know, probably close to 10, at least uh, six or eight projects using it and trying to expand it, including uh, people like Arte, who's a public broadcaster in, in France and Germany. And that, this has happened in the last couple months, right? So this is the front edge of what's going to happen. And you're going to see Link TV actually talk about some very similar stuff in the next panel. So next slide. Time and hypertext. That's one thing to watch for. The next thing is uh, I think you're going to see more and more this idea of the internet inside, where the internet is a character, is an actor, is a part of the experience of both linear and nonlinear films. And so what this is, it's kind of stupid, actually. Does anybody know what the Kuleshov effect is? Right? So a couple people. Right? So the Kuleshov effect was this experiment by a Russian filmmaker. And he's, he kind of has this one shot of a guy, like Rainer up there. Um, and he puts you know, happy pictures in front of him and does a kind of cut away to the happy picture as if he's glancing at it. And then cuts away to a sad picture and cuts away to a, you know, a boring picture. And the audience perceives that the emotions change on the person's face. And so we did a little Kuleshov effect with, uh, thing with Rainer here. Um, and it, it's kind of crappy, actually. We need to work on it. But the thing that's happening is people are tweeting about Lev. Lev is actually the name of, uh, I think is the first name of Kuleshov. Um, that they're tweeting, Lev feels sad. Lev feels angry. And what that does <laughs> when you tweet that 
is it actually pulls up a picture from Flickr and pastes it into that laptop that has those same emotions tagged to it. And so the, the joke in this, of course, is the internet is a character, again, in the video. And that's something you're going to see more and more, the internet inside, in real time, of the movies uh, that we make, the journalism we make. So just third slide. Um, I think the, the, the last thing I want to underline is you're going to see the crowd adding value to film, cinema, and journalism, actually, in particular. Um, and this is something called Universal Subtitles. It's also a project we're working on uh, the, with a group called the Participatory Culture Foundation. And basically, they're using that open video tag, the basic uh, availability, of, uh, availability of video on the web now in standard HTML to make it possible for anyone to translate any video anywhere. So that's not a small goal, but they're actually, in the course of six months, quite a ways towards something that's usable to do that. And that's what you're seeing up there. And the real lesson in that is not that that's cool, although it is. The real lesson is that it's not just things like the Ridley Scott example that we heard on the last panel, where we get people to kind of submit footage and they get edited into something where the crowd will have a role. I mean, that's awesome. And it's also based on a traditional set of ideas about how the filmmaking craft works. What is going to happen is all of these other dimensions, including something like subtitles, but also that semantic data that I was talking about, will become places where people who we traditionally had thought of as viewers will add to the dimensionality of the experience of moving images. So next slide. And I'm just finishing now. And there may be time for questions, but I, I doubt it now because of the slide clicker. So the million dollar question. Um, those are some things to watch for. Um, I guess everybody wants to know, how do you make money from that? Um, I don't know all the answers to that either, but I, I think there's, there's a bit of a theme to, to think about. And um, it actually, if people were here during the Wikipedia session this morning, next slide, um, the theme starts with this funny thing where the Wikipedia said, well, you know, we're not very empowered. We're not like PBS where we can come in your face and interrupt the flow and ask for money. Now, of course, public broadcasting member drives are starting to decline, right? Because that's really annoying. It's not a good way to finance public media to have to interrupt programming. And the future of what pays for this, I think, is very much related to, especially what, how we pay for public broadcasting, which is, is my history, uh, very much related to, I think, the, the nature of the medium, the fact that the audience will be a part of this. And so I think where to look for, uh, where, to look for where the money's gonna come from for this is to where else, where there's business innovation on the internet. So next slide, please. Um, and so one place there's business innovation on the internet was the Obama campaign. And what's critical about the Obama campaign, especially when you compare it to that PBS fund drive we just saw, is really the kind of language which is about being a part of the thing and being, in this case, a part of a movement and contributing because you, you know, contributing through your time, through organizing a meeting, through going to a meeting, through tagging a video, through whatever it is, editing a Wikipedia article, and with money. And so I think increasingly, Public media, if it can learn from the internet, and I had a meeting with some CPB people the other day, um, nobody's trying this yet in public broadcasting. If they can learn from the internet and learn from people like this, um, can probably raise more money and be less annoying. Uh, and so I think that it's not a matter of the money disappearing out of the picture. I think it's a matter of changing our ideas about how both the relationship to the people formerly known as audiences work and the relationship to the money. Next slide. So the last thing I would just say in terms of the money that I think is really critical for this conference uh, is people are on the internet starting to blur the lines or even forget that they exist or don't think they matter between what's public and what's private, what's for profit and what's nonprofit. And that's what's really interesting about Kickstarter. How many people have heard of Kickstarter? Right, so like almost everybody. So here's this funding thing that didn't exist a year ago that almost everybody in this room has heard of. And this project, Diaspora, which is these kids in New York who want to kill Facebook, had a $10,000 pledge and raised $200,000 on Kickstarter. And nobody asked, are you a 501c3? Are you going to make money off of it? People wanted to pitch in. And 
that is the spirit of the internet, which I think we'll see more and more with people who are actually doing stuff that can get others excited. Now, there's all kinds of bad stuff about that, especially as a Canadian who believes in the important public role of media that's not going to get made or financed by anybody. We still need to do that. But I think we can look to the internet and look outside of people who are struggling from traditional media histories to say there are some clues to how this stuff may be financed. Next slide. So let me just wrap up, and I don't know if we'll have time for questions, to say um, as we bring in people or as we invite people to work with us beyond Firefox uh, with this new drumbeat initiative, next slide, and in particular with web-made movies, which is very much targeted at filmmakers and journalists, um, next slide. We're certainly hoping, hoping that people like you will get involved because our sense is it's not just the engineers who will shape the next 50 years of the internet. That in fact, the people in this room will play as much of a role in shaping where the internet goes as the engineers will. Next slide. And so, if the next slide came, please. Uh, my invitation to you is to do cool, cool shit and get the next slide uh, and build the open web and next slide. Um, hopefully, that's something that we uh, share as a goal together. And I think that's all I have to say. Next slide. Uh, there you go. Thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for putting up for the lack of a clicker. So I'm just going to ask. I don't have time for questions, right? I'm assuming. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.